I'm going to begin reading in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I want you to really think about what I'm reading to you. You need to, if you have your Bible with you, rather than watch it on the screen, it'll be up there. But you need to look in your Bible. You're going to find between this morning and this evening's message, uh, this message is 18 pages long. When I'm going to preach about 30 minutes, I have one that's about 7 pages long. I'm not going to preach all that this morning. That's why I've divided it into two messages. Um, we're going to get the bigger part of that's going to be this evening. And, and let me tell you one of the reasons that I'm preaching this particular message at this particular time. I, I just uh, called upon the Lord to say to him that I needed to know exactly what he wanted on this day. Uh, those that would be in the church building and those who would be listening by our various media, he'll have the right person at the right time who will hear this message. This morning's will be relatively short, but, but one of the things that I did in preparation for this is I found a guy on the internet, don't remember his name at all, but he was preaching on hell. I did not find it on any of the typical areas that I normally find that kind of things, like Sermon Central or something like that. I, I just found this guy. The Lord led me to it, I believe, and he basically did uh, preaching on it, just kind of like what I'm doing now. He just talked and read Scripture. And I, I couldn't believe how convicting and how powerful that was. Now, I want you to stop and think for just a moment. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, be sure of that. Be sure of that. I'm not saying that to put any doubt in anybody's minds. I'm not. Uh, doubt is a horrible thing. Uh, as I've shared with you in the past, uh, that was something that plagued Donna early on in, in our marriage. Uh, she had a lot of doubt as to whether she was really born again. And she got that settled. She got peace in her heart about that. Some of you who are listening to me now, maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe occasionally there's these doubts. What if, what if this happens? What if I die suddenly? Like this young man, just 29 years old. Hey, listen, it had, it's only been a few weeks ago, a lady 44 years old, just fell dead. It happens all the time. And, and that soul, like yours, if you were to die, goes directly into the presence of God or, or else goes directly to hell. There's no in-between. And there's no hope once you have died. It's over. It's done. You're going to spend eternity where you're at. And so it's imperative that as I read this, especially the Word of God, as I read the Word of God, that you will allow the Holy Spirit of God to penetrate your heart for His purposes. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Now, I'm reading that to you. I thought about eliminating it, but the reason that I'm doing that, He's doing this so that the, the people at the church at Thessalonica, a church that was deeply concerned that they missed the rapture. A church that was deeply concerned that the second coming of Christ was about to happen. He says, I'm giving this to you. Your trouble rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. For what purpose? In verse 8, he tells us, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now what I want you to get from that is the reality of hell. It's not a popular subject. I don't know many preachers that want to preach on it. I don't. I know what the purposes are for it there. The, the Bible says a lot more about hell than it does about heaven. Jesus preached on hell a lot more than he preached on hell, a lot more than he preached on heaven, as I'll be revealing to you a little bit further on in this message. But here's a reason we need to look at this. You, you all know the slang terms that people will use telling someone to go to hell. And they, they use that not because they're literally thinking that. They do it as a slang. And, and, and I bring that up for you for one simple reason. We need to understand that the devil is doing his best to desensitize people to hell. Surely, that's not a real place. Okay, I see that it's in the Bible, and I see the Bible says a lot about it. But there's no way possible that a loving God could send someone to hell to suffer for all eternity without end. Over and over and over again. 
Now, if you're going to dismiss hell, there's going to be several ways in which you're going to do it. You can reach into your Bible and you can just uh, reach in there and you can say, well, I think what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I don't like these passages on hell, so I'm just going to tear that out and it's not going to be there anymore. And then you go on and you tear out other places that you don't like at all. Some people do that. My problem with that is, how do you know? I mean, is, is this just a whim that you can just pull out whatever you don't like and, and accept what you do like, so we'll keep everything that's on heaven in there and throw out everything that's on hell? And when we throw out everything that's on hell, we, we leave the justice of God. The holiness of God is disrupted because we have eliminated that from our life. Sin is no longer such a terrible thing because there's no punishment for the sin. Oh, baby, it's a little slap on the hand or something like that. But there's no fear of God that anybody has. But if you believe in hell as I believe in hell, that it is a literal place that people really do go to to spend eternity. And once they're there, they can't get out. then it disturbs you a great deal. Now, as most of you know, the Bible has been written in two different, basically two different languages. Most of the Old Testament, with the exception of a few chapters in Daniel, has been written in Hebrew. And in the New Testament, it's been written in Koine Greek. And there are a number of phrases that the Bible uses, in fact, four different phrases that the Bible uses to refer to hell. Now, I'm going to tell you what those words are. For instance, in the, in the Hebrew... And the Old Testament, the word Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, it's up on the screen behind me. Sheol, and this phrase is translated 31 times as the grave in the Old Testament. It's, it is interpreted 31 times as hell in the Old Testament. And three times as a pit in the Old Testament. And when it's referring to punishment, listen to me, when it refers to punishment, it always refers to hell. Let me give you an example of that that I'm going to read to you found in Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17. Here's what it says. The wicked shall be turned into hell. The wicked are going to hell. And all the nations that forget God. That's a really interesting phrase. The United States of America is well on its way to forgetting God. Does that mean that the United States of America is going to be cast into hell? According to this, it does. Those nations, nations that forsake God, will be cast into hell. And then there's the word that we're most familiar with in the New Testament that's the equivalent of Sheol in the Old Testament, and it is Hades. It's divided into two places, Hades is. There's a place of punishment and a place of paradise. When one of the thieves repented of his sin on hanging on the cross of Calvary next to Jesus, you remember what Jesus said. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When Jesus arose from the grave, paradise was put into heaven. It's not a place that people go to anymore. It was put into heaven. Because when people die today, they go directly into the presence of God, directly into heaven. Acts chapter 2 and verse 27 says... Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now, I, I've resisted the temptation, 18 pages long already on this message, to get into even further depth. And when you read verses like that, I know that I'm leaving you hanging. But maybe it's tantalizing. Maybe what you will do instead is you'll go home and get your Bible out and you'll get a good concordance in the back of your Bible if you've got a good study Bible and you'll look up the word hell and you'll read every verse. There's a bunch of them. You'll read every verse that you can about hell. Maybe it'll do that to you. And you'll take verses like I've just read you and say, wow, I don't understand that. Good. Then study it until you do because you can. You can know. The same God who wrote this Bible lives within you and he'll interpret it for you and explain it to you if you'll let him do it. And then there is the word Tartarus. And this phrase is used only one time in Scripture. It's a place for fallen angels. Now, if you're not familiar with that, I preached on it not too long ago. There were those angels that fell with Lucifer uh, long before the world was established, and they were cast out of heaven. And the reason that they went with him is because Lucifer, being the, the cherub that was so beautiful, and he, he decided that he wanted to be like God. And God cast him out. And the result of that was that, he went, that all of the fallen angels have gone to a place called Tartarus. 
2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 refers to that when it says, For if God spared not the holy angels that sinned. That's the phrase I want you to get. God did not spare the angels that sinned. They were sent to this terrible place called Tartarus. That's where they're suffering. They're going to be released for a short period of time. You're not an angel. And I'm not an angel. We are totally different. Angels that sinned against God have no hope of being saved whatsoever. None. But you do. Now you may look at that and say, well that's not fair. I'm not here to tell you what's fair and what's not fair. I'm here to preach the gospel to you and to preach to you what the Bible has to say about these things. Look, if, if you don't agree with this, you better pray you're right. Because if I'm right, you're going to suffer forever in hell. Forever in hell. Excruciating suffering that you can't even imagine is going to be on you in hell. And then there is the fourth term, which is Gehenna. It's used as a description for the lake of fire. Now, I'm about to read something to you, and I want you to pay real close attention. Hell and the lake of fire are not the same place. A lot of people don't realize that. How do I know that? It's found in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The eternal abode of all the lost, including the fallen angels, is in the lake of fire. The Lord will take hell itself and cast it into the lake of fire. Now I want to give to you some of the popular perceptions of hell. I'm doing this so that you won't look at it in a a way that, that is frivolous. You won't use that term that I used a moment ago in telling someone where to go. If we really understood what hell was and really understood the the terrible things that happened to people there, we would never wish anybody, I don't care who they are, we would never wish anybody to go to hell. Regular cartoons are in some newspapers showing the devil standing on a mountain with a pitchfork. Flames are all around him and his subjects in hell are sitting around lamenting some things and telling jokes And the devil has people to caricature him and make people look at him as a cartoon character. He's not really real. He's just that guy with the horns coming out of his head and and he's just that guy that has that long tail and that pitchfork. He's not real. Little kids will dress up on Halloween like the devil. I'm I'm not standing here to tell you how to have your kids dressing up. and We don't much like when we have our our, uh, thing that goes on here around Halloween time, our fall festival. We don't much like for people to dress up like that. I don't like to see them in witches' costumes and things like that. I, I like seeing them come as dressed as, as other kinds of things that aren't like that because that, that, that trivializes hell. And as much as you may want to trivialize hell, you're doing a terrible injustice to people. If somebody walks away from you believing that hell's not a real place, you've done a terrible disservice to them. So the devil has movies that make fun of hell. Uh, You can see that up here, the background that I have used, I searched the internet to find something that that would meet the criteria that I have to have. I realize it gets a bit faded when we put it up here on the screen because of the lighting. And I've got to make certain that the letters are are readable for you. I've got to make certain that the right colors, you put red on there, it's very difficult to see unless you have a very strong background. But the the pictures that I use almost always have meaning. I don't just select something because it's a free picture. And this is a a depiction that somebody has given, the best they can do, of people in this lake of fire where they're spending eternity swimming around in a lake of fire, falling but never reaching a bottom, as I'm going to point out to you in tonight's message. It's a terrible place, a place of agony that we can't even begin to imagine. And that popular perception is we need to make certain, and one of the reasons that I'm preaching it today, that it's true. Let me, let me talk for just a second about these near-death experiences that many people will have. They supposedly die. Some very convincing things. I, I've shared with you a deacon down in the, uh, one of the Baptist, independent Baptist churches down in Texas. He shared with me a long time ago. Uh, came to me in the late afternoon, told the pastor he'd like to talk to me. He said, sure. And he said, he's going to talk to you about a death experience that he had. And, and in the surgery that he had, he, his, his soul left his body. And he hovered above his body at the top of the operating room. And after he came back, he, he told people what they were saying in the operating room, which was what they were saying. He was talking about what he saw from that perspective as he looked down on himself and what was happening. They were, they were clamoring about him. We're losing him. We're losing him. That's what they were saying. 
He was telling them about that, and they said, look, we're, we're not going to judge what he's done. All we can tell you is that everything that he says he saw and heard is accurate. Was his soul leaving his body? I'm not going to judge that. I didn't judge him. A lot of reports like that, but let me tell you what bothers me. There are a lot of people that will give you this, this very common description of what death is like. That somehow they died, uh, however that might have been, a car accident, might have been through some surgery or something. But anyhow, their soul left their body. And they'll begin to tell you what things were like when the soul left. I saw this, this tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel was this great light that I saw. And I started heading right toward this great light. And this warm, fuzzy feeling came all over me. And I was no longer afraid anymore. And boom, they were back in their body. And then all of a sudden they're standing in front of people and they're saying, I'm not afraid to die anymore. It was such a good feeling that I had when I was there. Never knowing anything about Jesus Christ and the fact that he died on the cross for their sins. I don't know what they're seeing. I've, I know a scientific explanation that's been given about the brain and how it, those kinds of things can happen to you. All I know is this. If you trust Jesus as your Savior, whether you have that kind of experience or not, you're going to heaven. I don't know what it would be a bright shining light or what it would be. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you die, you immediately go into the presence of God. Immediately. No tunnel to go through. No light to go through. You are in the presence of God right now when you die. That's what the Bible says. And so they come back saying death isn't so bad. And um, that tunnel of light was just giving me a great feeling. Listen, we are not a people... To lean upon our experiences as a test of truth. A guy tells me that he's anointed his car with oil because the car would, wouldn't start. And when he poured the oil that should have gone into the car itself, the engine itself, and he poured it on the car, and, and lo and behold, when he got back there, he turned the car on and it started. Well, that's proof, isn't it, that that works? Isn't that proof of that? I'm being facetious. You, you know that I am when I say these things to you. But there are people, and, and I'm convinced it's the devil that's behind it all. The New Age movement and, and all that they try to teach us designed for people not to be afraid of hell. Listen, you may be looked upon as a weirdo because you believe in hell. Uh, people are going to respond to what I'm preaching here. I guarantee you people are going to respond. And they're going to say, that guy's nuts. He's crazy, man. I don't, I don't care what the Bible says. Hell is not a good place and it probably doesn't really exist. That's where a lot of people want to leave that at. The devil's doing everything that he can to take the fear out of hell. To take the edge off the Bible teaching about hell. And the more they do that, the harder we ought to preach against it. Satanism, witchcraft, all the occult. It's causing people to feel that things after death really aren't that bad. Every now and then you'll have somebody that will come along and they'll say, you know, a terrible thing happened to me. One guy played it here for the church some years ago. I got it from Dr. G. James Kennedy and, and um, this guy who did not know Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior and said so. Uh, he was run over by a train, chopped his leg off, was hanging on just by a thread, and, and he clawed his way to get to an intersection where people would finally bring him in and get him help, and, and he died. He says he died. He came back to life, but he says he died. And he said, all of a sudden he was in these flames and this fire and he was screaming out and crying for mercy and begging for someone to take this, this terrible pain that he was feeling. And he said, he said, that's because I went to hell. That's what he said. Once again, I'm, I'm telling you those things, but I want to tell you right now, I'm not going to judge these experiences. I just know the truth of the Bible is trust Jesus as your Savior. You go directly into the presence of God when you die. If you do not trust Jesus as your Savior, you will go directly to hell and suffer forever. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Hell is a real place. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. I'm just giving that to you because, as I've already read to you in many other places, hell is a real place that people go to. And it can never be filled up. Isn't that an interesting phrase that it gives to us there in verse 14? It says it just enlarges itself. 
Don't get the idea that all the people in the world couldn't fit into hell. He says it enlarges itself in order to accommodate all the people that are going there. What does the Bible say? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way of righteousness that leads to heaven. The whole purpose of that is telling most people are going to hell. That's what that means. Most people are going to die in eternity and spend eternity in hell. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 20 says this. Hell and destruction are never full. Hell and destruction are never full. Hell in and of itself, in the, in the unbelievable way that it's been created, is there to accommodate every human being who has ever been or ever will be born on this planet. It opens its mouth up and swallows men and women. The devil and his angels, they'll be cast there forever and ever. And he knows that's his end. He knows that's his end. Now, I mentioned to you a moment ago that the preaching on hell is a, really an interesting thing because Jesus preached almost twice as much about hell as he did about heaven. Isn't that fascinating? Why would Jesus preach a lot more about hell than he did about heaven? Well, in the New Testament, hell or Hades is mentioned 23 times, and in 16 of those occurrences, Jesus is the one who utters the words. Out of 23 times it's used in the New Testament, 16 times, Jesus in his preaching is the one who used it. See, I, I pointed that out to you for this reason. A full two-thirds of Jesus' preaching was on hell when it came to these subjects. And what's very important for us to understand about that is, is to ask ourselves a question, why would he preach so much about hell? Well, I, th I think there's a legitimate answer, and it has to do with the desire of God. Jesus preached on hell because God doesn't want anybody to go there. Did you know that? If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God does not want you to go to hell. He has made every provision so that you will not go to hell unless you stubbornly decide, I'm going to. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you don't get anything else out of this message, get that. God doesn't want anyone to spend eternity in hell. I remember years ago. When Dr. James Dobson led a serial killer to the Lord, this guy had killed a lot of women, lots and lots of women. And I remember the outcry that came. This guy trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. I remember people talking about him saying, is it possible this guy's gone around killing young women all of his life and he's going to spend eternity in heaven simply because he said, Lord, save me? Did you hear what the choir sang this morning? Grace. It's all about grace. Nobody deserves heaven. I don't care who you are. You don't have to murder anybody at all. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. And that's why it's grace. You know, you may not have killed anybody, but you probably hated someone. You may never have committed adultery, but you probably lusted in your heart. You may never have named any sin you want. You see, because the propensity is there. We have it within us because of the evil nature that each and every one of us possess. God wants people to repent and to change their minds to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what John 3, 16 says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has done everything possible to keep you out of hell. Everything possible to keep you out of hell. He sent His Son to die on the cross of Calvary for you. The sacrifice for you because of your sin. To rise from the dead because of the ability to justify you. So you wouldn't have to go to this awful, horrible place. Do you even have an inkling of how horrible this is? Uh, I, I'm going to say come back tonight. I don't, I don't know why anybody would come back to hear a message like this except for one reason. We're Christians. 
We actually believe in hell. And we're hoping and praying, I'm hoping and praying this will be a great motivation to us. As I was preparing this message and doing various things and reorganizing, resituating things, I got to thinking about that. Every person I meet is going to heaven or hell. Every person has that destiny, one or the other. Heaven or hell. No matter what their denomination, every one of them are going to go to one of those places, heaven or hell. Every person that you love in this world is going to go to one of those places, heaven or hell. Jesus preached on hell because even a slight understanding of that place should motivate people to get saved. If he can just make us understand what hell is really like, no one will want to go there. You you may be thinking, you know what? I've heard about this stuff before. This is scare tactics. Trying to get people saved just by scaring them. You really believe that's the right thing to do? I'd rather scare them than I would see them spend eternity in hell. Any person in their right mind would be terrified of the things that I'm preaching. You mean to tell me people are going to go there forever and ever? Scare them in, scare them out of hell? Great, scare them out of hell. See, you know, that's consistent in every other thing that we know. Society doesn't just tell people why we shouldn't break the law. It tells us that if we do, we're going to get fined or put in jail. There's going to be some kind of punishment that you're going to have. Schools don't just tell students, don't do this and don't do that. They have punishments if they do something that they shouldn't do. I know I can hear you saying this, yeah, but for eternity? For eternity? You mean to tell me this is forever and ever and ever? Stay with me. That's what the Bible teaches. Hell never ends. You've got to reject this book in order to reject hell. You do. If you're saved, then praise God. Praise God that you're not going to hell. If you're not saved, I hope that I'll scare you enough so that You'll leave this place today having trusted Christ as your Savior. If you do go home unsaved, I hope that every single thing you do today, and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, that the Holy Spirit of God will bring back to your mind again and again and again. Hell is a real place. Be careful when you cross that street. Getting hit by the car could be the least of your problems. You could end up in hell. Be careful about... You better be. Because the next stop is hell. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The purpose of hell. What is hell? Now this is very important to listen to. Hell is the vengeance of God. We love to hear about how God is such a wonderful, loving God. He loves us, even in the midst of our sin. He has a perfect love for us. Do you know what we're looking at here when I'm preaching on this? We're looking at the holiness and the justice of God. Every sin, every single sin, must receive a just recompense of reward, of of punishment is what he's talking about. And and the reason that he points that out to us, you're either going to trust what Jesus did, the only thing that can take sin away, or you're going to try to to take it away yourself, either by living a good life or by doing some of the things that you want to do. But nothing can take sin away except the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember again in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Here it is. And flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God. The day's coming. He pleads with us today. Let me save you. I love you. I died on the cross to prove my love. You should never doubt my love. But if you don't, he's going to come back with vengeance upon this world. We hear a lot of teaching today about the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. God is angry at ungodliness. And hell is the 
punishment of God. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. That's the Bible. Take any translation you want. Look at any of them. It says the same thing. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. It never ends. The gospel of Christ is simply this. Please hear me. Please hear me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. That's it. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. His promise is, you do that, I will save you. From what, Lord? From hell. Hell is the punishment and vengeance of God to those who neglect and reject His Son. Now these things are going to flash on the screen behind me. Watch carefully. God wants you to quit trusting yourself. God wants you to quit trusting your church. God wants you to quit trusting your good works. God wants you to quit trusting your money, your pastor, your prayers. And he says, just trust Jesus Christ. That's it. You escape hell. By trusting Jesus Christ. That's it. All right, I'm ready. I don't want to go to hell. I don't. Right there where you sit, at this very moment, you call out to God in your heart and say, Oh Lord, I believe upon Jesus Christ as my Savior. That means what He did on the cross, He did for me. I'm a sinner. And I believe upon Jesus Christ as my Savior right now. Let's stand with every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, you look into the hearts of all men. Nothing is hidden from your view. You know every sin that we've ever committed or ever will commit. You know our rising of the sun tomorrow and what that day is going to hold. You know everything about us. And yet you loved us. You created us. There's not a person listening to me that you don't love. Oh, Father, I pray you'll bear witness with their heart of that love because it's imperative that they understand you always put these together. Hell is a real place that they're going to go. But you don't want them to go there. And you've made every provision. Oh, the cost that it was to you. For your son to suffer hell upon the cross of Calvary. For every person that would ever live. That is activated by faith. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask in this invitation that if there's one that does not know Jesus, that you will save them today. But even now they will call out to you, Oh God, save me. I believe upon Jesus Christ. And for that Christian who's struggling with peace in their heart, they're not sure. Well, Father, help them to turn to you, the only one that can give the assurance of salvation. And for those of us who know we're saved, beyond any shadow of a doubt, Oh Father, before this day is out, may we be so conscious of every person that we meet, they're going to heaven or hell. And may we, with all of your love, give them a track or say a word on your behalf. Invite them to church. Give them our testimony. But turn them away from this horrible place called hell that they might not spend eternity there. Burn it in our hearts, Father. Cause us to speak of him wherever we go. The praise shall be yours because we ask it in Jesus' name. Please continue with every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian pray. I can't see into the hearts of people, but God can. And I'm waiting here for you. You find the aisle closest to you,
and you just tell me why you're coming. Coming to trust Jesus as my Savior, you may say. Or maybe you're going to come and say, I know that I'm born again, but oh, I'm not being the witness that I should. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want every eye that I catch today, every person's face that I look in, to have that question mark. Where are they going to spend eternity? I'm waiting for you while they play through this verse. They'll play through one more verse and then we're going to sing a verse and then the invitation is closed. Oh, I beg you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, be saved today. Right there where you stand, call out to Him. Oh, Lord, save me. I believe upon Jesus right now at this very moment. Jesus. Let's sing a verse of that, Dan, if you will. This is your 